Number 59. X in the series The Picture of God in All 66 by Graham Maxwell. Recorded April 1982. Now, oh, for next time, Romans. Can you imagine doing Romans in one evening? We've done Romans in um, 16 evenings, didn't we, one time? Or several times. In fact, right now, we're doing Romans this quarter, two sessions a week for a whole quarter. We started in March. We've just finished chapter one. But you see, if you do the right thing with chapter one, you lay the basis for all the rest. It's worth spending the time. It's so important, though, to read Romans aright, to give it a chance. It's such a collection of key texts. We're inclined to be uh, already so conditioned as to the meaning of those passages through the years. Is there any way you could read Romans as if it were the first time? See, when Romans arrived from the city of Corinth, and when we're studying Corinthians, we'll have to consider a little more the circumstances under which Paul wrote to Rome and to Galatia. When the letter arrived from Corinth, it arrived in one long scroll, maybe 14, 15 feet long. And someone stood up and read it out loud. Think how we demand the best text right in front of us so we can carefully weigh every word and every sentence. They didn't have that opportunity in Rome. They listened as someone read it out loud all the way through. And when he came to a difficult passage, people couldn't say, wait a minute now, go over that again. We want to compare and analyze. We want to get the concordance out and the lexicon out. No, he went on reading until he got to the end. And I've learned that if you read a book that way, there will be far less difficulties because give the writer a chance to explain himself. Read on, as we've been doing. As you know, there were no chapter divisions. They were invented around 1200 AD, not BC, AD. And the verses were invented around 1551 AD. So if you could, in imagination, picture yourself in Rome, listening, not reading, listening, and someone is reading this letter all the way through, and he's not pausing at the chapters, he's not pausing at the verses, he's just reading all the way through to the very end. And then if it would be possible not to read into the words too much theology that we may have inherited through the years, but let the words speak for themselves. But that's so hard to do because you'll be reading the word justify. Now, you know, justify has all kinds of legal connotations that have become attached to it. They heard the verb in Greek, dikaio, which may or may not have had all those legal connotations attached. In fact, I'm inclined to believe they were not. That word may have been the simple equivalent of set right, put right, as today's English version has it, which is a suggestion, by the way, if you want to read it in a version that would be quite different from the more traditional ones, use the Good News Bible, today's English version, and it translates justify as put right, which is wonderfully close to Ellen White's set right, which he uses several times. So if possible, when you come to a verse like Abraham had faith in God and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness, don't immediately let cash registers ring. See, that's only one way of reading that verse. It could mean Abraham trusted God and God said, that's good. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. You're my friend and I will save all my friends. And there are no legal connotations to that at all. Though, of course, the great majority of theologians for hundreds of years have read these words and phrases as legal. There is another way. So, would that in imagination we could be back in Rome listening to it being read out loud. If you're in a position to hear it read out loud, you might like to do it this week. It's not that long. If you could have somebody who reads well, read Romans to you, and don't allow yourself to look. Just listen. That's the way it was in Rome. And then when you've heard it all the way through, imagine walking home from the meeting and saying to someone walking along beside you, that was a tremendous letter, wasn't it? Um, what was it all about? Very complicated. It would take at least a quarter with many theological works to understand the meaning. Then it wasn't of much service, was it? I think when the saints went home from that meeting place in Rome, they discussed the meaning of that letter and things had been clarified, not mystified. Or well, Paul had not been of much service to them. And you remember, he determined on Mars Hill he wouldn't be so complicated any longer. You remember in Axford and Height, 
he was going to preach Christ and him crucified, which also does not have to have just a legal meaning either, though many theologians have preferred to see it largely that way. Well, I hope you enjoy Romans anyway, and do have a good version for it. If you don't have today's English, what would be best? What will you be using, by the way? You'll be using, oh, you have it right there in a fine printing. Yes, excellent. Today's English is most refreshing for Romans, otherwise known as the Good News Bible, the American Bible Society. What will others of you use? The Living Bible. The Living Bible? <clears throat> yes. Now, you know, I think a lot of, of Dr. Taylor, when I read his biography, I thought, there is a, is a really Christian gentleman. But because of his strong convictions and because of his uh, confessed freedom in paraphrasing, which is not illegitimate, once you say that's what you're doing, his deepest convictions do come through, as in Romans 3 when he explains why Jesus had to die. So when you're reading Dr. Taylor, you're reading not the original Greek necessarily, but you're reading the convictions of a good man. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with him, but you will enjoy him, I'm sure. Yes? You gave quite flowery phrases for Phillips, but how does he handle Romans? Very cautiously. In fact, in some of the passages where uh, you might expect him to interpret quite freely, he backs away very cautiously. See, Phillips does not interpret as much as people suppose. I worked it out statistically one time. It's really quite surprising. His concern is, is really just to make it clear and leave it more to the reader to determine the meaning. Well, I, Phillips for Romans is very good. If anyone has Goodspeed, I still think Goodspeed's translation of Romans way back in 1923 deserves our attention. Does anybody have Goodspeed available? The Chicago Bible? The Smith Goodspeed Bible? Think of that marvelous piece of work he did back in 1923 and hardly anybody's using it anymore. That's the fate of things, isn't it? It's too bad. But if you have a chance to pick up Goodspeed, his New Testament in American idiom, and that's rare, in American idiom, but almost 60 years ago, is still one of the very best. What else might you use? Don't hesitate to use a Catholic translation of Romans if you think they'd be wrong on righteousness by faith and you shouldn't read a Catholic version on Romans. On the contrary, it may be very well done. Yes? How about the international version? The New International? Yes, a, a highly evangelically oriented but very scholarly version. Yes. Um, if a certain term like justification can be given a certain legal translation, they might prefer to go that direction. But this is not willful manipulation. I don't see any of that. You've got to make a decision as to the meaning of the term. And if there are choices, they would, they would go that way, the more traditional way. Now, that's a fine version. Yes. Recommend the Good News Bible then over the NIV? I don't like to recommend one version over another as a whole. And the safe thing is to have them all, which I like to do. <laughs> then you can make your choice. There's no one perfect one. I like to lay them all out side by side, and uh, then I settle it by opening up the Greek, which doesn't settle it after all. All it does is tell me what the problem was that these honest translators were facing. You see, and I find how honest they were, because I look up the word in the Greek, and then I look in the lexicon, and I see all the possible meanings. That's the way it is, you see. Reading is bringing meaning to words, and we bring meaning from our whole background. And it can be a very honest Christian background, and yet not be precisely what Paul intended. Our greatest concern is to come as close as we can to what Paul intended. And that might be a good point to wrap this up. The only way we can find out what Paul intended is to read all of Paul and to see all the places where he uses this term, all the other places. He may be giving a special turn to a word or a phrase. You know how writers do. So I feel with Romans, when we're doing it by itself in a class, instead of reading other books of theology on Romans, I ask the students to read Galatians and to read Colossians and to read Ephesians and to read Hebrews if you want to find out what Romans means. That's the best. A man years ago, long time ago, became tired of all the commentaries that had appeared even in his day. And he wrote an article entitled, On Interpreting St. Paul by Consulting St. Paul Himself. And I like that very much. And so do feel free with Romans, any version you like. Even the Greek, if you wish. That's, that's what they heard in Rome. They heard it read in Greek. 
But if you have the opportunity to listen to it, would maybe uh, enable one to have a somewhat new and fresh experience with Romans. Well, I'll be specific as, uh, for an advantage to this. You take in Romans 1, it speaks of God's wrath. And that his wrath is giving people over to the consequences of their own rebellious choice. And then you wonder, well, what's so serious about God pouring out his wrath? But if you read just a passage at a time, you'll never come to the answer. But if you keep on reading, you'll come into Romans 3, where Jesus is shown publicly dying. And in Romans 4, where it says that God's wrath was poured out on his son, that is, he gave him up to the consequences. And you'll note that you really have to read to the end of 4 to get the significance of chapter 1. So it is a shame to ever stop. The key text method has been very convenient for neatly organized theology and for Sabbath school lessons and, and many worthy purposes. But for understanding a writer, it's not the best way because it's discouraged us from reading as a whole and, in, and allowing the writer himself to explain himself. And Romans is a very good example of that, I think. Well, all this is to invite you to for the umpteenth time, reread Romans and it'd be a re rewarding experience. One thing for sure, do use a different version from the one you've used up to this time. Now for tonight, Acts, <clears throat> volume two of this church history by a physician uh, who may have written more than Paul. It's, it's almost exactly a tie, a minister and a physician together writing so much of the New Testament. And last time we looked at the two opening paragraphs, so we don't need to do it again. You remember the first paragraph in Luke and the first paragraph in Acts has the writer himself described them as volume one and volume two of his whole history of the life of Christ and the early Christian church. Think of the picture of God in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now that it was new, the whole Old Testament had borne witness to this truth about God. Look at Jeremiah's picture and, and Isaiah and Hosea and Amos and Micah and others in the Old Testament. But now Jesus has come and has clearly demonstrated at risk of life the truth about our Heavenly Father. And you think of what the disciples are now privileged to take out to the world. Now they knew what God was like, and they were not that clear when Jesus began, were they? You remember, they asked him, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And do you wish that fire would come down from heaven and consume your adversaries? They didn't know God that well. But they had been together in the upper room and heard Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And there's no need for me to intercede with the Father for you, for the Father loves you himself. And in the judgment, actually... You'll just be judged by the truth, that's all. Nothing arbitrary about it. And they'd seen him feed the hungry and heal the sick and cry at the funeral of one of his friends and all those things. And now they were to go out and spread the good news. You'd think the world would be thrilled, but it was no more thrilled to hear them than it was to hear Christ. In fact, from whom did the strongest opposition come? Hasn't it always been the history? Yes, God's professed people opposed this picture. In fact, one hesitates to mention this in these modern times, but in chapter 13, verse 50, did you notice that even the devout women opposed? Not all of them, but some. We think of the ladies as the first to be persuaded so often in evangelism. They also can provide strong opposition. Did you notice 1350? But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men, they were together, of the city, and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. So even the devout women were opposed. But look who incited them, the Jews. God's own family had rejected his son, and now they were making sure that nobody would accept the truth that Jesus had come to reveal. Why do you think, again, at this stage, the Jews did not like what they had heard? And now as the disciples went out to explain it the best they could, and they did learn to do it better and better as time went on. Remember, Peter had much to learn yet, 
And the brethren in Jerusalem had much to learn, yet they, they still thought they should hang on to the ceremonies, you remember? The, the, the commission was given to the early Christian church when it still had a lot of theological progress to make. See, just because we're commissioned doesn't mean our, our theology is perfect. Because certainly the early Christian leaders did not have a perfect theology, but they had the essence of it. And they went out to give the good news. Why do you think the, the Jews in particular did not like this message? And it even stirred them to acts of violence. What was really so offensive? He, he yes. Was, he was just a common man and they looked for a king. All right, suggestion is that they were so wedded to another view of God and another view of the Messiah and another view of what God had in mind for the Jews that he was nothing but a disappointment to them. Yeah, what do you think? Well, the more they were uh, convinced of the truth, yes. probably the guiltier they felt about what they had done. So it exposed their guilt. <clears throat> You're thinking maybe of Stephen's speech as an example of that. When he put his finger on their consciences, the only um, way out was violence. They had to silence a man who was that perceptive. All right, any other possibility? Yes. Verse 6. 1-6? Yes. Don't you think that starts it out? Yeah, Read still, yours. They're, they're actually still thinking here that yes. they're still going to be independent politically, apparently. Yes. Read your version on that. Oh. Um, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Yeah. They still, he's about to leave to go to heaven. Maybe off the ground. Yes, that's right. That's right. And... Um, he said, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Sumeria and to the end of the earth. He gave them that commission way back then. You know, we've often thought how almost presumptuously ambitious it was for the Adventist church in its beginning to talk about taking the gospel to the whole world. You remember how he sent the first missionary out? And it seemed uh, incredible. But the early church was just as small, and the Lord said, take it to the whole world. That's Christ's last word. That's right. That's right. But now, what do you think of the suggestion? They still, I mean, these are God's appointed evangelists now. They are still asking him, aren't you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you remember such good friends in Luke 24? Remember Luke wrote... Uh, the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts. And in the last chapter, which is only a few lines ahead of where we are in Acts, so if you had Luke Acts as, a, as one volume without um, John in between, then what we're about to read in Luke 24, 21 is right next door. Look at 24, 21. Wouldn't you agree that the men who walked with him on the way to Emmaus were real saints? But look at their hope. 24, 21. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. So they were disappointed. Even his closest followers were disappointed. And then you remember we did talk about the Apocrypha and the anticipations of the Messiah in some of the Apocryphal books, you remember, when we talked about Between the Testaments. And then do you remember when he fed the 5,000, or maybe more accurately the 15 or 20 or 25,000? When he began to talk about his real mission, which was not going to be free food and free medicine, they left him. See, they welcomed that kind of thing, but not what he'd really come to reveal. Do you remember his triumphal entry? How thrilled they were, at last, now. And then they abandoned him. Within a few hours afterwards. Did anybody, do you think, yes? somewhat summarized that <clears throat> when he was talking to the Samaritan woman yes. and the disciples came back and they tried to feed him and he said, you know, I have food that you know not of. Yeah. And I think that was really the message that he was trying to convey to the Jewish people and of course to be yeah. conveyed to the whole world. That it was this type of relationship that Christ was emphasizing above the comforts of their own nation and your own prestige. And they, that was diametrically opposed <clears throat> to what they had in mind. Now, that's interesting to think about. While you were talking, I found that stimulating. Um, here the Son of God has finally come to the earth in person. Not that he hasn't been leading Israel all through Old Testament times, but now he appears in human form, born as a human, so he can really communicate with us. 
And he has something of inestimable consequence to present to this planet in the eyes of the whole onlooking universe. And he picks, of course, the ones who would be ready to recognize him. <laughs> Wouldn't you think so? He'd come to Jerusalem. He'd come to this. He never had to argue with them over whether they were keeping the right day. When he went to church on Sabbath, everybody else was there. That was no problem. And when he went out to eat, they didn't put anything on, on the table. He couldn't eat. You know, it's nice to live with the fellow believers. You don't have to say, what's in the sandwich? You know, what's in the dressing? You don't have to worry about it. What's in the soup? He could always be confident with this. And so you'd think he'd have a perfectly wonderful time bringing them this good news. But the only time they were really inspired was when he performed miracles. They liked the show of power. And when he healed and he fed, things like that, this they liked. But this isn't what he'd come to talk about. What would you say he had come to talk about? Relationship. What kind of a relationship was it? Well, an individual, a one-to-one -one relationship. I think in most religious uh, doctrines, if it's very carefully spelled out, circumspect on each thing, the majority of people are, feel safer that way. If they can run and consult this or that, that's what they want to do. If, uh, for instance, in our own circles, we hear of some new or different uh, interpretation coming, we run to some authority and say, what do you think about this? We don't perhaps uh, try to think of it ourselves or try to study it out. Uh, we want instant answers, perhaps. And, and Christ came to show us that it was this one-to-one -one individual relationship that he wanted. They, they weren't buying that. They wanted it. Could it be one-to-one, -one, though, and not be desirable? I mean, the one-to-one -one relationship is only desirable when it's with a certain kind of a person. Because it's interesting that in the mystery religions, the reason why they were so popular in the time of Christ was they did offer a personal relationship with a, an individual savior God. I, and uh, I think the devil, knowing that Christ was going to come and show this, um, counterfeited it in these uh, amazing mystery religions. So part of it is, yes, you have this relationship with God as with your heavenly father, but um, what kind of a father is he? See, not everybody likes his father. What kind of a father is he? And he cleared that up also. Um, in fact, if they had been um, reading their Old Testaments as they should, they should have been loaded with questions for him. Like, uh, could you explain divorce to us? Why did you give divorce laws? And they'd have loved his explanation. Well, it was only an emergency measure because of the stiffness of your necks and the hardness of your hearts. And uh, How about eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? How about the stoning of Achan? And all those other things. They should have asked him. W what a record we would have, the, the disciples incess incessantly questioning the Lord about all these stories and teachings in the Old Testament. On record, they never asked him once about those matters. So he had to bring them up himself from time to time. Or the Jews brought them up indirectly, trying to trap him into misinterpreting the Old Testament. But what a chance for a really studious person to sit down with him and ask for an explanation. Well, Nicodemus, he knew his Bible inside out, and he sat down. And he didn't ask very good questions either, did he? A skilled teacher that Jesus was, he didn't have very good pupils, very good students, very disappointing <laughs> So that's why on Resurrection Sunday he couldn't wait to go up to heaven and find out if he'd had any good pupils anywhere. And they said, yes, we followed every step of the way. You've won your case. It was more than enough. Oh, that must have been reassuring to him. Then he was encouraged to come back to his duly appointed evangelist who still didn't understand what it was all about. And he says, well, go out and spread the good word. I know you're not too clear what the good word is, but my spirit will be with you and will bring these things to your remembrance. And he worked hard on Peter, you remember, in the book of Acts. And he worked hard on Paul. And in the end, look what happened to Peter, and look what happened to Paul, and so on. One doesn't have to be perfect to be called, fortunately, or we'd all be without a calling. But there was something about Peter and the others that commissioned them to be at least interns at the beginning, and the Lord would qualify them as they went along. But on the most serious level, Jesus made it plain, I've come that you may know the Father, because to know him is life eternal. And if only you knew the truth about my Father, it would set you free. And all these rules and regulations that deprive you of your freedom and make life so burdensome, I didn't give those to you. Away with them. Wouldn't you think they'd be pleased? 
Well, the closest parallel I can think of is the Minneapolis General Conference in 1888. When a marvelous explanation was given about the law being added as an emergency measure, not the way God wants to run his family for eternity, but when there's misbehavior in the family, he will tell us, please stop it. Don't hurt yourselves by doing it anymore. If you're not concerned about hurting yourselves, then let me tell you, I am displeased when you do this, and I will punish you, and so on. God says, I do not wish to run my family that way. And that marvelous message at Minneapolis was rejected by many with such feeling that Ellen White said, if Jesus had appeared, as he has just now in the New Testament, if he had appeared before the delegates at that general conference in Minneapolis in 1888, many of the delegates would have rejected him with the same stubbornness with which Jesus was rejected in the first century, then we're still capable of doing it. And I sense even now in some theological meetings that when you begin to talk about the fact that all God asks of us is trust, as Peter said to the jail at Philippi, which you must get to in a moment, and the whole Bible is the record of the evidence that God can be trusted, people don't just oppose that, they become, become very active in their opposition. And it almost seems that history is repeating itself. And you wonder why we don't like this. Understanding what God has asked of us in the plan of salvation, in the setting of this great controversy over the character of God. And that the whole substance of the good news is that God has shown himself to be infinitely worthy of our trust. And if we choose to trust him, God can and will save all who trust him. That's all he asks of us. And Abraham trusted God, and God said, that's good, you're my friend. You'll be with me in my kingdom. All my friends will be there. And then when some are pictured by Jesus as saying at the end, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he says, go away, you never were my friends, which is the meaning of I never knew you. I know your name, I know how many hairs are on your head. Well, we never were friends. And some feel that's oversimplifying it. That's the most demanding requirement you can come up with. Do we really trust God wholeheartedly so that we're willing to listen and accept correction and whatever needs to be done? Well, if so, like the thief on the cross, God could say to us, don't give up that trust, that humble willingness to listen, because you stay that way, I can heal you, and you will be with me in the kingdom. And that's good news to me, and I read the whole Bible that way. And yet, strangely, there is a preference for a highly legal, much more complicated explanation. And I see overtones of that through Scripture. And it doesn't make sense, because it doesn't bring the freedom that they may claim for it. Well, we'll get into Romans, and that will really show it more. But here in Acts, the disciples go out with the good news. They knew their Old Testaments. They knew the life of Christ and his teachings. They knew his death. They didn't fully understand why, though they'd spent some time reviewing it, you remember, before Jesus left. But then after he left, they reviewed it some more, and then they were commissioned to go out, and they ran into such opposition. Now, we're all familiar with the story with Pentecost and then Peter to the Gentiles and Paul's great missionary work. What shall we pick out? There's so many things in here. Since the Holy Spirit is mentioned very quickly, is this the first mention of the Holy Spirit from Pentecost on? There's no greater mention of him than in John. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, you remember, at great length and what his work would be. Is that the first mention? What's the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the biblical record? Genesis, Genesis page one, isn't it? Right at creation, he was here. How about uh, his work to win and convert and convict and um, lead us into the truth? Is that in the Old Testament anywhere? Think of any references to the Spirit doing this kind of work. Well, think of all the places, innumerable places. And you remember when David confessed his sin, he said, And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What had led David to repentance but the work of the Holy Spirit? So you remember all the verses we looked at on the way through, referring to the Holy Spirit. Then why did Jesus say, It would be better that I go, and then the Holy Spirit can come? Why did he say it would be better? He only stayed three and a half years in his ministry. Yes. I am very happy to ask that question for you. <laughs> Jesus was yes. uh, 
incarnated. Yes. And he will always be. Yes. And he is handicapped from being everywhere. Yes. And so to improve upon the kingdom yes. and its impact, he let the omnipresent one come. And I think that's very omniscient of him to do that. Would you say then that on Sabbath morning, during the pastoral prayer, all around the Adventist circle, when we pray for the present, the gracious presence of the Lord Jesus in our midst, this is really not possible anyway, and we ought to stop doing that. I'm saying he's there by the Spirit. But he's not there. He's limited, geographically. That's, what I'm saying. Yes. That's why he gave the Spirit. See? That's why, you know, when you think about, no one has a monopoly on Jesus. Yes. Yeah. But you see, you mean the Spirit hadn't been here before? No, no, I'm not saying that. You then why say, would it be better for Jesus to go if the Spirit had been here all along? Jesus had done his work. Yes. And he had shown yeah. the love of the Father that which is true. Yes. Yeah. And then the Spirit came to apply the truth. <laughs> no, you said something. Maybe the word came shouldn't have been in there. The Spirit had been here all along. W w would you all grant that? The Spirit has been here all along. Is it possible now for the Spirit... Not to point forward to revelation, but to point to the evidence that had been revealed. He could be more persuasive. Um, but then we still have the words of Jesus, it would be better that I go. Why would it be better for Jesus to go? We'd say, please don't go. No, it would be better that I go. Yes. He's going to be at the right hand of his father. Why would it be better for him to be there than here? What advantage is there? To apply the intercession, the efficacy of his sacrifice. Do you mean the Father couldn't handle this alone? <laughs> <laughs> Would you know, uh, with all reverence, I think the one who wanted us to ask him like this was the Lord when he was here. When he said he'd do these things. And we'd say, well, why do, why do you have to do them? For example, I'm sure he wanted them to ask him about the whole priestly service. Because the priestly service implies that someone must stand between God and his children. Whereas God says, I want to treat you as my friends. In fact, you remember in the Gospels, Jesus said to the disciples, up till now I've called you my servants and you've been honored to be so called. But from now on, I'd like to call you my friends. Because a servant doesn't understand what his master's doing, a friend does. And I've told you everything my father has told me. And so I want you to regard yourself as my friends. Now Moses was a friend of God. And nobody had to stand between Moses and God. God talked to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Does not God always want to speak to his children as friends? Does he want somebody in between? A mediator, as uh, between England and Argentina right now. They're not talking directly. Somebody has to come in between, which suggests there's tension there and there's misunderstanding. When the ideal circumstances arose, Jesus talked to uh, Abraham directly and talked to Moses directly. This is what he'd like to do. But then the priestly system suggests somebody has to come between. And if only the disciples had said, could you explain what that means? We see you talking to Moses and talking to Abraham as your friends. And now you say, we're to be your friends. Does that mean we can talk directly? He says, yes, you can. And there is no need for me to intercede with the Father for you, for the Father loves you himself. One of the highlights in the whole Bible. And we say, no, we'd rather have somebody in between which means we'd rather pitch our tents at Sinai, where they said to Moses, you're a friend of God. We're not so sure about ourselves. You speak to God, let him speak to you, then you speak to us. But don't let God speak to us directly, lest we die. And some have never moved their tents from the foot of Sinai. Though we've camped around that mountain all these years, and you remember the leader said, you've camped around this mountain long enough, it's time to move on. But if only they could have discussed that with the Lord, we'd have more in the record. He cleared it up before he left, even though they hadn't asked. So our discussion right now, I think, in all reverence, is something we need to do. If Jesus had not gone up to the right hand of the Father, could the Father not have conducted the business? 
of salvation? Did he need his more experienced, sympathetic son to aid him in all of this? Why does he need to do that? <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Dr. Hank? Uh, By the way, Romans and the books to come will all get us into this, won't, won't they? Yes. I'd like for you to comment on Evangelism, page 616 yes. and 617, where it says, The prince of the power of evil can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, uh, it, By the way, I'd like to put it, with that that when we're tempted, the yeah. armies of heaven come down to defend us and the Holy Spirit directs the battle, which goes right along with what you say. We go together then. You can't work without any one of the three. But all three work together, and the Holy Spirit has to be there with God, and God has to be with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ has to be with the two, and so you have nothing but one in the end. In fact, the Holy Spirit is God anyway, right. and so Christ is God. So, but it says that in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy yeah. Spirit mm -hmm. is what holds Satan in check as far as this world is concerned, because he's talking, she's talking about what's happening here on this earth. Well, why would it be better for Jesus to go so the Spirit could hold Satan in check better? Because the people will congregate around a, a human being that they can see yes. and try to get next to him, mm -hmm. and as a human, he can't be everywhere at any one time, but as God, he could be, and mm -hmm. it would be hard to be a human here and then say, well, I'm over there too, but uh, you can't see me, but I'm there anyway. And so you can trust me over there just as much as here. But who would believe that? Now, that ties in with what you said, and not to be overlooked, is it? Now, yes. I just a question. Um, is it possible for any man to come to God yes. except through Christ? What does that mean to you, though? There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. What does that mean? If I come with the wrong name, I will not be saved. In that case, what is the name? Who is God? Yeah. But Jesus said, you will ask in my name. And he recommended that. Of course, what does it mean to ask in his name? Would it mean if I didn't ask in his name, the Lord would reject the request? And he might say, that was a beautiful prayer for the first five minutes. But when you got to the end, you didn't ask in the Lord's name. So I, I cancel out everything before that I was planning for you in response to that prayer. You know, this wouldn't make sense. Is it rather that if Jesus had not come, and he didn't just come in New Testament time, he was the leader in Old Testament time. 1 Corinthians 10 4, coming up shortly, says that. If Jesus had not revealed the Father to us and even to the angels, we would not have known what relationship he wanted us to have with him. We would not have known whether he could be trusted, that he wants to be obeyed without fear. So um, Hebrews is really going to discuss this. Because of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we can approach God with confidence. And 1 John 4 says we can even approach the judgment and the God of the judgment without fear. So if Jesus had not come, we would not know how to do that. There's no way to come to the Father but through what Jesus has done. So when we end our prayers, we ask this in Jesus' name or all the other phrases we have at the end. These are not supposed to be idle, terminating marks of punctuation. Or as we've sometimes said in church, indications to the choir to get ready for the response. It might be well to put we ask in Jesus' name at the beginning of the prayer. Just as amen belongs at the beginning, just as much as at the end or in the middle. It means I really mean what I'm saying. Likewise, we approach thee in your son's name because if Jesus had not come, we wouldn't know how to approach thee. So there's nothing formal, is there, or arbitrary about that. That is, if I came to God and God said, hey, how did you get here? You came up some other way. I'd say, but I'm here and I love what I see, and I'm willing to listen, that's no good. You came the wrong way. You come the regular road. No shortcuts. No, that would make God arbitrary. Well, what do you think? How yes? would you get there without his sacrifice? Beg pardon? How would you get there without Christ's sacrifice for your sins? Is it, is it? Now, that's the question. How does the sacrifice for our sins help us to get there? You couldn't get there any other way. Didn't, yes? Didn't Christ become man and yes. condescend to the earth yes. to be with one of us, to bring God down to us. All right, Hebrews is really going to get into that, isn't it? And then when he went back to heaven, did yes. he go back to heaven to bring us up to God? 
Now, how does he do that latter? How does he do that latter? Bring us up to God. What's he actually doing? That he could do better up there and the Holy Spirit here. And that's our point right now because much of what we're discussing will come up in the later books, won't it? Very much. But why would he say, it would be better that I go? And one suggestion already is, if he were visibly present, the tendency would be to congregate around him in that one small part of the planet. And he says, go to the whole world. It is interesting. Jesus only came to that one small part visibly, didn't he? But he wants everyone to feel led directly by God through the Holy Spirit all over this planet. So that's one suggestion. But are there maybe other possibilities? Yes. Uh, the people at this time, even up to Christ's crucifixion, they look to him as a king yes. and to restore the kingdom. But uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. If he should go back to heaven at this time, the Holy Spirit would plead with their hearts, which would be needed, is needed. He pleaded and pointed to the Father, but he didn't get the, the numerical success as the Holy Spirit would. Do you think the Holy Spirit is more persuasive than the Son? Well, Ellen White says that Pentecost is Jesus' harvest. Yeah. He sowed the seed, and the Holy Spirit will it. But the thing about your, your questions, from my point of view, is we're talking about the, the Trinity. Yes. Which is another one of those incomprehensible mysteries. Mm -hmm. So I'm smiling while I listen. Mm -hmm. And yet we have Jesus' words, it would be better that I go. And yet we know the Holy Spirit has been here all along doing his work, which it would appear is not one whit different from the work of Christ. He's a teacher. He said, if I go, I will send another counselor, like myself, another of the same kind, and he will do the very work that I have been doing, but you won't see him. He will quietly work behind the scenes. Well, this on your point there, he said, you will do greater works than I have done. Yes. You know, so I put... You know, it's okay if those reverently in the same kind of category. Mm -hmm. It's better for you that I go away, and now we can do greater works than Jesus has done. Well, now, after Jesus left, and they realized they were alone, though he said, I do not leave you orphans, uh, in the Greek, you're not alone, the Spirit will come and guide you. For the very first time, they sat down and opened their Bibles and went to work. They actually began to think things through, but why do that when you have the Lord visibly present? I mean, if the Lord were here tonight, and we should have a question, why would you go and get the books out? Why not ask him directly? And Jesus says, it would be better that I go, because you'll never grow up if you don't start thinking it through for yourselves. And so he says, it's better that I go now. And you can't see the Spirit. If you want to consult the Spirit, you'd better open the books that he has inspired. You'd better read those. And as Ellen White says, even the work of the Holy Spirit on the heart must be judged by the Scriptures. So he doesn't come as just a voice of authority. He comes with the authority of truth, which you will find in the Scriptures. And the men began to grow up in the upper room. And when finally they realized that their message, the authority of their message lay in the truth, which they found as the two men on the way to Emmaus did. They found by comparing the teachings of the Old Testament with the life and the teachings and the sufferings and the death of Christ, when they put that all together, at last they were ready to go. And then the Spirit showed himself. He'd been there all along. Who'd, who'd inspired the scriptures they were reading? Who was guiding them in the interpretation of these scriptures? But when finally they put it all together and they were ready to go, then the Spirit appeared. And some say, the Spirit came. No, they wouldn't be where they were if the Spirit hadn't worked all along. Now the Spirit gave them visible endorsement. Now you're ready to go. Now you take the truth. And you're going to take it just as you found it. You're going to take the Bible. Look how, look how Paul did. You're going to take the Scriptures out and you're going to tie in with that the culminating revelation based on the Old Testament to be found in the way Jesus lived, the way he treated people, the way he suffered, and the way he died. And then they really had authority and power, but not a visible leader. And that's the authority we have. So I think there are many ways, perhaps, in which it was better that Jesus go. And the one that appeals to me most is, they never would have grown up so long as he was there, and they could run to him and say, is it this, is it that? And of course, then they were preoccupied with being with him in the kingdom. What position will I hold in the kingdom? He said, there's much more important things than that. I think I'd better go. I think I'd better go. 
and leave you to think this thing through. And they grew up. They still had some growing to do, as you recall. Peter had some growing to do, but in the end, he really grew up, didn't he? Yes. Well, we must consider the negative factor of the Holy Spirit. If we sin against the Holy Spirit, we are lost. Okay? So we, the, he enters into uh, our worship uh, more so than we normally uh, give him credit for. Is it more serious to sin against the Holy Spirit than to sin against Christ? Uh, we can disregard Christ and sin against uh, and he, it will not cause our loss. But if we disregard the Holy Spirit, it will cause our loss. Why is that, do you think? Well, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> well, do you think God has a list of sins and the worst one, the one he just cannot tolerate, is the sin against the Holy Spirit? That's right. That's what he said. Because that would be arbitrary if there isn't a reason for it. Now, what would the reason be? Yes. I think it's because... Uh, with the Holy Spirit, He can work internally within you, yes. continually prompt you. But yes. if you sin against Him, shut Him off completely, then there's no more prompting the Holy Spirit can do to you. I, you won't allow Him to do it to you. Yes. So to sin against Him is, is not really uh, doing Him anything, but just shutting Him off. Yes. You know, God can talk to you all day, but mm -hmm. uh, if you shut Him off, you know, what can you do? Yeah, you know, Alan White is eloquent on this subject and just magnificent comments. I have a whole lot in my folder here, but the clock going around not to stop and read them. If the work of the Holy Spirit is to convince us of the truth, he also is the one who inspired some of our fellow believers to write out this record of the revelation of the truth about our God. If I resist the Holy Spirit, I'm resisting the truth. I'm resisting the evidence. And since the truth evidence, the weight of evidence is God's only means, particularly the truth spoken in love, is God's ultimate means of persuading me. If I turn that down, it, there is no other way. That's all. There's nothing arbitrary about this. You sin against me, I can forgive you, but you sin against the Holy Spirit, I'll never forgive you. That's arbitrary. That's the devil's picture of God. It's just that God's only instrument of persuasion and conviction and even healing is the truth. And if I turn the truth down, well, this is how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He brought a revelation of himself to Pharaoh. To no other ancient monarch did God reveal himself more clearly than to Pharaoh. Pharaoh could have said yes and been softened by the truth and maybe gone with them to Canaan. That would have been an interesting scene, towing uh, Pharaoh in his chariot across the wilderness into Canaan. But uh, he could if he'd responded. Sure, just as Judas could have been touched. But Judas turned this down. Pharaoh turned it down. And if you keep resisting the truth, it does something to your mind. And eventually, the power to think and to do is, is destroyed, the image of God within us. And then there's nothing more that God can do, and it's not arbitrary at all. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit is revealed through God's Word, is yeah. not? And um, the same principles that apply to our daily, everyday living apply also, and uh, even more so, to our spiritual life. And not too long ago, I think it was last summer, so there was a hunger strike yes. in, in, in Ireland. And the men there refused to eat. Yes. And they refused food long enough till it came to a point where they went into a coma. Mm -hmm. And so shortly after they went into a coma, um, it got to the point that even medical help That's right. couldn't help late. them at all. It's too late. And, and there was nothing that the doctors could do because they had refused food for so long mm -hmm. that nothing could have raised them back to life again. And the significant parallel there is they destroyed themselves. Yeah, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't an act a single act, but it, it yeah. was a, a period of time. Persisting. And that's said so many times in Scripture. Well, now, with reference to the Holy Spirit, did you notice Stephen's magnificent speech? He must have been an evangelist. I mean, de deacons don't preach like that, do they? Isn't that significant? He was a deacon. And it's most significant. But he couldn't have made that speech if he hadn't read his Bible through, rather carefully, book by book, I think. Because what a summary he gave. And as he came near his climax at the end in chapter 7, the, his audience realized where he was going, and Stephen sensed their growing opposition. Knowing he had a few moments left, he brought his speech to a climax, as you recall. Look at 51, 751. In the light of all this history, he says, You stiff-necked people, circ uncircumcised in heart and ears, Hey, how did he know about circumcision supposing to be the heart and the ears? Well, that's as old as the Old Testament, isn't it? Jesus emphasized it, but it's in the Old Testament. You always resist the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, they resisted the Holy Spirit. 
Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? That is, as your fathers did, so do you. That is, as your fathers resisted the Holy Spirit, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you've now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth against him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed. You notice when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you speak the truth and you speak it with focus and you speak it with power. And Stephen was doing it. And remember, he was a deacon. Don't underestimate the deacons. Deacons should do more preaching, it would appear. Gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. What didn't they like about what he said? It was so true. And by the way, he was only quoting the prophets. You remember all those prophets who talked about the stubborn resistance of the people? He wasn't making up anything new. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Would you have picked him to be the prime evangelist for the early Christian church? And as they were stoning Stephen, he prayed what Jesus prayed on the cross. Same thing. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Think of it. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was consenting to his death. And in Acts 26, you remember, we'll look at it in a moment, Saul says that when um, the early Christians were condemned to die, he was adding his assent. So he saw nothing wrong with destroying early Christian heretics. Saul was consenting. But do you think that when he heard Stephen cry, Father, forgive them, he says, I, I hear that the uh, number one heretic of all time did the same thing. And in his mind, he must have had a brilliant mind, he was putting all this together. And it only troubled his conscience the more, because as it reads on, on that day a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul laid waste the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. That's the kind of man he was. At least whatever he did, he did with zeal and, and with feeling. When he was God's enemy, he was his worst enemy. When he was his friend, he was the best one he had. The thing is, whatever he did, we did with vigor. And Ellen White comments on the need of the church for leaders who have strong feelings but have their feelings under control. Laodiceans don't have strong feelings. That's what marks them. They're rather lukewarm. Not too good, not too bad, reasonably good. And the Lord would rather have somebody who's very cold, somebody who really has strong feeling because then he could do something with him. As we've mentioned before, I think lots of saints comfort themselves that they never do anything very bad. But if you'll observe, Neither do they do anything very good. They just never do anything very much at all. They just lead a lukewarm, reasonably good life as they wait for the Lord to come. David, when he was bad, was notorious, wasn't he? When he was good, inspiring. And Saul was the same. And God needs people like this, not that they have to sin to qualify, but... At least people who, are, who have capacity and really feel keenly about things. Now you notice that they needed a substitute for a Judas. What do you think of the method they used to pick one? Yes. Before you, let yes. That, before you leave that talk you just had there, though, uh, I see two good things out of this. Yes. Thing. I see first, uh, perhaps Stephen's death was the price we had to pay to get Paul. Yes. And secondly... Yes. God had just said to them just a oh, yeah. short time before, get this message going out into the world, and they were still huddling right there in the same little yeah. village. Yes. They hadn't gone out and started yet, but persecution drove them to do what they were supposed to do. Yeah. You notice the leaders didn't leave somehow. They survived. They stayed at headquarters. The people went out. Not until Jerusalem was destroyed were they finally bodily scattered everywhere. It did take a while. That has interesting uh, parallels in our history to think about. Yes? Um, really quite on the subject, but... Yes. In, in regards to the evangelism, um, so often um, in this day and age, 
uh, particularly among the Christian world in general, they, they always say Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah. And uh, they give you the indication that all the rest of the disciples, even though there's little record mm -hmm. of anything that they did, all huddled and, and hung around with the Jews. And I was just wondering if there was, a, if there was any evidences um, that the other apostles left the area um, and went to the rest of the world. Um, because the, what we read in Luke, the command by Jesus was that they would, they would go to all the world. There is interesting evidence, of course, one of the first is Peter's experience with Cornelius, which we should look at in a moment. But then in early Christian history, the story is told of the apostles going all over the world to incredible, yes, to incredible distances. It's very interesting to read about. I wish we had more uh, ability to um, validate some of the stories. It's just, um, it, I don't know, once it hears me, it's just kind of, um, is there any e evidences other than just rumor? <coughs> well, written it's, it's the way we reconstruct history at best anyway. We just have to collect whatever, um, even legends and, and stories and whatever documents there are. And the evidence seems to be that they did scatter. And you know where Peter wound up his ministry? In Rome, where he was crucified upside down. Yes, he went. You were going to ask a question a while ago and I didn't come back to you. Sorry, it's about the Holy Spirit. Oh, to say it. I was thinking of Corinthians, you were talking about the power of Jesus at his death and so forth, and yeah. the Holy Spirit. I always thought that uh, when Jesus went to heaven, he was glorified, and he yeah. brought the uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, yes. the body of Christ, and he was trying to bring unity mm -hmm. and knowledge to uh, the saints and those who would accept him. Mm -hmm. I think that he's, that's, that, was, that was always what was, that was in my mind. Uh, I was at the time when he was at the point of the saint. Yes. Right now. No, I, I like the picture that was suggested that, that the Holy Spirit who is united with the other members of the Godhead Jesus said I and the Father are one and the Spirit comes he will be a counsel just like me they are all united in working for the unity and peace and harmony of the universe and, but the Father occupies a certain role and the Son has occupied a certain role and the Son is back in the presence of the Father conducting this work but the Spirit is here leading the angels we shouldn't leave them out in this work of evangelizing and we cooperate with them the unity is what I was trying yes. to express, that, uh, that was his yes. objective. And the significant thing is the only basis for genuine unity is not force and manipulation or even the bailing wire of rules and regulations, but truth, trust, and love, and are these not the fruits of the Spirit? So the only way to have genuine unity, which God has now better evidence to work with since Jesus came and lived and died as he did, as has been mentioned, now the Spirit can guide in the finishing work. Now this has been done. He calls our attention to it. He seeks to convince us, not against our will, but he, he has a mighty power to convince that some of us, seeing this truth, might, as Ephesians says, be one to the unity that is inherent in our faith and our knowledge of the Son of God. Yeah, I see the Spirit doing that, working through the angels, but they in turn work through human beings who are now hopefully friends of God and consider it a privilege to speak well and truly of their Heavenly Father. We're going to get into that in the epistles. It will support what you've said. But now looking at these many other things, um, what do you think about casting lots as a revelation of the truth about God? Would he bless a method like that? Do you use it in church uh, for appointing of offices? <laughs> Not this year? <laughs> My question is, I heard uh, one of the preachers say, of another denomination say that uh, Matthias, the whole yes. business, was uh, not to be the man, that Paul should have been the man. I see. And uh, I wanted you to sort of respond to the issue that uh, maybe they jumped the gun <laughs> in trying to place Judas. Well, I think one could have as good arguments uh, against it being Paul. I think that it was very significant for Paul to be able to say, I was not one of the twelve, but. And in Corinthians, he gets into that, as you know, in some detail. One should not derive one's authority from appointment to office. But he bore the truth. And he said, I see evidence that the Spirit has endorsed my message. You are my uh, commendation. Uh, well, when we get to Corinthians, we'll really get into that. He didn't need to be one of the twelve to speak with authority. In fact, he never went on the payroll, <laughs> as you know. What the guy was saying was, you, you hear about Matthias being appointed. Yeah. And that's all you That's all. And that was his point yeah. of saying is, that's why uh, they jumped the gun. Do you think the Lord chose Matthias? They chose two men and they prayed over them, which means they thought they both were good. 
Ellen White is free to comment that the Lord does not approve of that method, but he blessed them. He had in many times, like the, uh, the, uh, the rod that budded and there were leaves and blossoms and even olives on it. I mean, uh, almonds on it. Uh, the Lord is very gracious. He meets us where we are and, and helps us as we use these methods, but it's not ideal. Well, let's hasten on to some other things, though. What do you think about the transformation of Peter all through here? I mean, uh, what a disappointment he was the last few hours of Jesus' life. And yet uh, the angel said to Mary, and be sure to tell Peter that he had not been abandoned at all. Of course, if Peter hadn't wanted to be treated this way, it would have been hard for the Lord to do it. Who rushed to the tomb? I mean, he really cared, like Mary was so honored, but she rushed to the tomb too. You see, John, Peter, Mary, these are the ones who seem to care the most. And um, during the time of the trial, Peter at least was nearby, shaming himself, but he cared enough to be there. And at the cross, Mary was also there, as at the tomb, and John was there. These three were, were, were very much involved in this, though they made a lot of mistakes. But Peter now, what do you think of his development? Tell he'd been with Jesus. <laughs> yes. What evidence do you see of, of his growth? Well, I love the way he was able to handle the Gentile question. Yes. With the Holy Spirit's function. <laughs> well, you remember, though, that in spite of his enlightenment about the Gentiles, that um, he had quite a lapse. In fact, let, let's, let's talk about what came down in the sheets that night um, about Peter. Yes. On this one. He took the message to the Jews, he took the message yes. to the Samaritans, he took the message to the Gentiles first. He was the one that took it all three times first. Yes. He always liked to be first, the first to walk on the water, <laughs> the first to draw his sword. <laughs> yes. Well, he was impulsive, but he had strong feelings, that's for sure. When he was depressed, he was in immensely depressed. In fact, Ellen White says when he knelt down in Gethsemane, he wished he could die. He was very depressed. Sometimes he was highly elated. But then, if the story is true, and Acts the Apostles endorses it, that when he was taken in to be crucified, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified as was my Lord. Crucify me upside down. You know, something has happened. But there's evidence in the New Testament. Let's look first. When he was on the roof there, and he had the dream, and the sheet came down, and the voice from heaven said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. What should a man of faith do when heaven tells him to do something? Should he not check his bumper sticker to see if it's still there? God has said it. I believe it. That's all there's to it. And Peter should have said, I don't understand it, but I don't have to understand. Who am I to question God's inscrutable ways? Hand me a knife and fork. But he didn't. Now, on what authority could he say, God, I can't do it? Did he not cite scripture and said, what you've once said is, I don't make sense out of this. God could have said, I don't have to make sense. I'm, I'm the potter. I can do whatever I like. Coming up in Romans next time. And so the sheet came down again and again. Peter said, no. And the third time, can you imagine the quiver in Peter's voice when he said, no, I, I won't do it. And I'm puzzled. I don't know what's going on here. And a knock came on the door. And he went downstairs and here were some contaminating people. Just a moment before, he was about to be contaminated by the creeping things in the sheets, and now he's about to be contaminated by these Gentiles. You see, they treated them about the same. And I think he got the message. Peter, you're right about the things in the sheet, but you're wrong to treat people created in my image like the things in the sheets. And he got the message, and he went with them. He was right in saying no. As he thought that through, he was prepared to meet those folk at the door. Oh, when I think what I've been doing. I've been treating you as if you could contaminate me, just like those things in the sheets. We're going to get into that in Romans and Corinthians. Paul discusses this a little later. Well, Jesus did in Mark, remember? When you come in from the marketplace where you've met these Gentiles and so on, unless you wash in a peculiar way, you will not eat. Lots of rules to avoid contamination. And he went, I'm sure quite uncertain inside, into a new adventure. And he ate with the Gentiles, with Cornelius. And he was enjoying, I'm sure, this breathtaking experience until some brethren came down from the general conference. And he was scared, and he withdrew, remember? And Saul said, you cheat, you dissembler. 
And he really leaned into him and he, he, he criticized him to his face and in public. Remember, it's in Galatians. Now, did, did Paul do the right thing? How do you know? Did a voice come from heaven and say, that's a good speech, Paul. You were right in embarrassing Peter before the crowd. So Peter embarrassed the Holy Ghost. And the yes. Holy Ghost had to let Peter know that he still was in charge. I'm high on yes. the person who was See, we know Peter did the wrong thing. Do we know Paul did the right thing? We do. Is there a commendation in the footnote? He has my commendation. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is very much on the side. You see, you wonder right now, when we're supposed to call sin by its right name, are we supposed to condemn people to their faces and in public? Well, maybe so, if the situation calls for it. But what I like is, we're not told whether he did the right thing or did it well. It's left with us to decide. What would you do? Jesus did not expose Peter, and he didn't expose Simon, he didn't expose Mary, he didn't expose Judas. How would Jesus have treated Peter? Now, maybe the situation called for Paul's rebuke. Maybe later on Paul thought, he hadn't written 1 Corinthians 13 yet. Hmm. In fact, I wonder if they ever got together and talked it over. But no matter what happened, what I love is this. When you get over to 2 Peter, when we get to the letters, Peter says, as our dear brother Paul has written in his letters. And so you know, Peter did not hold this against Paul. That's what I like. See, we're not talking about Paul, we're talking about Peter. He evidently was able to, to take this now. And that's why um, when you read the rest of Peter, you see accumulating evidence that Peter finally really grew up. Because he says, if anybody asks you for a reason for the hope that you have within you, always be ready to do it and do it with meekness and humility. That's a great verse in Peter. When he was asked in the courtyard for a reason for the hope that is in him, did he do it well with meekness, with humility? He did a terrible job. And uh, now with all that background, he's able to say, and he did it. When I'm arrested in Rome and I'm asked for a reason for the hope that is in me, I hope I can do it with meekness and with humility and not the way I did it out there in the courtyard. In fact, the story is true. He was captured and he was crucified upside down. But I like particularly the way he treated Saul, Paul, in spite of his public correction. You know, he might have harbored vengeance, feelings of hostility over that the rest of his life. Yes. Uh, am I hearing you to say that yes. Jesus handled Peter's uh, denial privately? You know, I remember Simon. I, I'm clear on that. Well, when they were on the beach and he said to Peter, do you love me? Three times. Did he say, I want all your disciples to come together closely here. You remember how Peter denied me three times? I'm going to try him out again. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Or were they talking quietly together? I think it was a group setting. It was just public as a, as a, as a, a, a affiliation of Christ. Yes. Yeah. Because it was public denial, and uh, I guess probably it was public. Of course, the nice thing about on the beach was, Peter said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And the Lord loves to give publicity to that. But when those rascals brought that woman, did he expose them before the crowd? When Simon showed such utter, a heartless dishonesty and arrogance, did he expose him before the crowds? When Judas betrayed his Lord, did he expose, did he expose him? So there's a nice balance there, and uh, may we know the right thing to do at the right time is all, because I'm saying that heaven doesn't say, we just have to weigh and decide what we're going to do under similar circumstances, and may the spirit of love and uh, truth guide us at that time. At yes. the, the meeting of a conference in Jerusalem, uh, was it Peter that uh, uh, took the part of the yes. Paul and made a very public uh, yes, he did. Uh, appeal for his uh, acceptance there? Yes. Did you notice in that speech, finally the brethren um, seemed almost reluctant to endorse Paul, and they said, well, at least we want you to go out and tell them not to eat food offered to idols. When he got out into the field, did he say, you may not eat food offered to idols? Romans will touch on this, but Corinthians especially the next time. He said, I suggest you go ahead and eat it. 
No wonder he got into trouble at headquarters, but they didn't know his reason for saying this. So that should add great interest to our reading Romans and, uh, and, Galatia, and um, Corinthians. But now there's so many other things in here. As a revelation of God, yes. In regards to the reproofs of, of, yes. of Peter and, and of the other apostles, I think maybe few of us have ever um, experienced a gentle, loving, and meek reproof. And the words don't do the words in themselves. The hard, cold words in the scripture don't do justice yeah. to uh, to the feelings behind them. And even as Jesus rebuked um, his disciples on several occasions, "Get thee behind me, Satan!" and it, it just doesn't con convey the lovingness and the meekness of a, of a true reproof. And so maybe we just look at the hard, cold words that that Paul rebuked. Um, and Peter with certain words without without really understanding the, the relationship that they had. Oh, I think you raise a very valid point. And Corinthians is the best place to discuss that. Because it would appear that Paul at first was inclined to be so very gentle with the sinners in Corinth. He was getting nowhere. And finally he sat down and he wrote them a Sinai letter and it worked. And he learned there is still a time to use that kind of language. But he says he cried while he wrote the letter. So it's right in there, just the point that you're making. Now, one more yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> encounter with that sheep. Yes. In the uh, beginning of the gospel church, there was a question in the disciples' minds how much of Judaism yes. could be incorporated into the new church. Yes. And uh, the doctrine of unclean meats mm -hmm. was an important one here. And Peter. Uh, established through the power of the Holy Spirit that the Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 were still in effect yeah. and in no way had been abrogated as a result of uh, the taking up of a new a leader, Jesus, and the teachings of the New mm -hmm. Testament church. So this was one illustration that we have in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, seconded uh, Peter's conclusion that the teachings of the Old Testament with respect to unclean meats still stood for the New Testament. But not church. the teaching with respect to circumcision. And what would make the difference is what was puzzling them at the time. Well, in Galatians and Corinthians, we really have, and Colossians, we have a chance, as you know, to really go into that. So let's remember what you said. As a picture of God, though, can you think of anything more direct? more directly relevant than what he did to Ananias and Sapphira. You'd think you were back in the days of the judges in the Old Testament. The two of them cheated with their pledges. And they didn't have to give any more than they wanted to, but they cheated. And one by one they died on the church floor. Now why is God still using that method? Why would he do that? Could not be uh, encountered there without uh, dealing with it because as Why doesn't he do it now? As the multitudes were gathering in there and turning in their gifts, well, yeah. uh, this could uh, be disastrous to the early church. Why doesn't he use the method now? Maybe not. We haven't had anyone die on the church floor in Loma Linda for a while. And, uh... <laughs> but you think of how the Adventist church right now is very strapped for funds. If you're in one of our institutions, you know the subsidies are way down for various and sundry reasons. and. Um, Remember the first Ecclesiastes, uh, money answers everything as we went through. Uh, there is some need for some funds. Well, you know there's one way to get them. If God would put selected people to death around the Adventist circle who were known to be careless with their offerings, you know more money would pour in than the general conference could use. Could you imagine sitting in church next week and someone near you dies? because he was not faithful in paying his offering. Wouldn't you immediately review in your mind, let me see, let me see, am I up to date? Am I up to date? Maybe I trimmed a little too close. Next week, I'm going to really uh, go the other direction. Do you think the folk didn't know about Ananias and Sapphira? No, they didn't know. How soon did they find out? Wasn't it known rather quickly? What the reason was why they died? Then did offerings pick up noticeably? Maybe by the Holy Spirit they knew? Yes. Because they knew before he died. How did Luke find out? 
Certainly by the time Acts was written, they had the whole detail from then, from the appearance of Luke's second volume, do you think, offerings really picked up? When they learned that even in New Testament times, God might put you to death if you don't pay your offerings faithfully. The lying was, was a factor in this. Yes. Rather than uh, being stingy. Well, wouldn't it make for generosity? And Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver, but if you're not cheerful about it, there's another method <laughs> behind the scenes. D does this make for giving that springs from fear? And isn't God uh, very much opposed to that kind of thing? Then why does he do it? Sinai, Achan, Nadab and Abihu, Cordate and Abiram, you know all the stories all the way through, and he's still doing it in the New Testament. Yes. Uh, Peter wasn't uh, reprimanding them for giving a small offering. Mm -hmm. He was reprimanding them for uh, yeah. keeping back part of what they had sold the property for and then lying and saying that they gave it all. Mm -hmm. He said, when you, before you sold it, wasn't it yours? Right. And after you sold it, wasn't it yours? So you see, the subject was mentioned at the meeting, wasn't it? So the audience knew what was at stake. Uh, but he said, you said you sold it all and you gave it all, but you didn't. So what would the message be? And if you don't, God will kill you. If you don't, you'll die. That, that inspires go. one to honesty. And honesty is what saves you. Yeah. But if you aren't honest... Well, if you're not honest, then you're open to suggestions that maybe you'll become honest. <laughs> Such as, I'll kill you if you're not honest. Yeah, you result in death because you're not honest. Yes. But it's it is the exception, the though, thing. someone said, he doesn't often do this, does he? Isn't it apparent that God very rarely does this? When he could do it all the time. If he wanted to use this method, he could use it all the time. If he wanted the reverence that springs... From the thunders of Sinai, we could have thunder all the time, couldn't we? But he doesn't do that. It's obvious that God does not like to use this method. But when the emergency is serious enough, he will, if need be. But who loses ground, really, every time he does it? In the great controversy, he pays a cost. He pays a price for this. It must then have been very seriously necessary for the early saints to take him seriously in this regard, as it was with Israel on the way into Canaan, for them not to trust God, weak people as they were. They'd never get into Canaan past all those Canaanites unless they trusted him and were really honest with him. So he made an example of Achan, he made an example of Ananias and Sapphira, but these are emergency measures, they're not the ideal method. These are the rare exceptions, aren't they? Yes. No, I was just going to comment that in the past, the only time God has used such methods was when there was disrespect being showed to him to yes. such a degree that he was in danger of losing all contact. Yes. And the, the, uh, the emergency really isn't put out in those kind of terms, but I, I would tend to view it in that way. Yes. There's something more going on here than we're told yes. about that yes. required such, such drastic measures on God's mm -hmm. part to get their attention back again. That is knowing what God is like. Here, after Jesus has been here to show what he's like, you would know it would have to be a very serious occasion to call for such action on God's part. Yes? Hypocrites are especially disliked by everybody. And maybe God yeah. doesn't like them either. Why do you suppose? <laughs> Why? They're dishonest. Reminds him of Why doesn't he like dishonest people? Do they offend him? Or is it that he can't work with them? He can't work with pride. <laughs> well, when you think of salvation as healing, and God wishes to heal everyone. He says, why will you die? I have the power to heal every one of you. But you keep cheating. Every time you come back to my office and I ask you, have you taken your medicine? Have you followed the program? Oh, yes, doctor. Oh, yes, doctor. Look, I was looking out the window last week and I saw you flip the medicine over the wall. And you stand here and say, yes. If you go on cheating like this, you're going to die. It isn't that I hate you, patient of mine. You happen to be my son. And I don't want you to die. But if you go on doing this, I'll have to give you up to the consequences, and you're going to die. And I don't want you to die. Isn't that why he says, cursed be the cheat? He can't save a cheat. He can't heal a cheat. But there's never anything arbitrary. By the way, speaking of arbitrariness, did you notice in Stephen's speech, did you notice in uh, 742, 
what God did to those who'd rather worship uh, idols than the true God. What did he do in 742? God turned and gave them over to what they wanted to do. Do remember that in Romans 1 next time. Verses 24, 26, 28, it says, If you prefer to worship these things, God will simply give you up, give you up. And the consequences are unspeakable. Remember Hosea 11. Well, here it is. Stephen understood this. This is the wrath of God when he gives a person up. Yes. I was just curious. Of all these examples you've mentioned that God has used to say something in a very strong way, what, uh, since that is a first death, and they were yes. examples to other people. What do you think will be their fate? Is there any indication that uh, since they were an example and maybe through that example had an effect on some other people around them and maybe even their death was a benefit to some people, mm -hmm. is there maybe still a chance for some of those people? Oh, I like to think about that because God's resurrection of the wicked can be understood in such a way as to put God in a very mad light. Think of resurrecting the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah to burn them a little longer. Why not just leave them asleep? Any of you want to see them burn a little longer? Why do that? So when he resurrects Ananias and Sapphira, I don't know which resurrection they're going to arise in. All we have from the record is they appear to be confirmed cheats. You don't know. No, that's right. What does it say? It, it does I'm, say that Satan filled their hearts, so it's pretty hard for me to imagine that yeah. Christ was abiding in their hearts at that time. Oh, but I don't know what their last thought was. I just don't know. I don't know. I'd rather say I don't know. It doesn't look very promising. But you see, I'm going to find out for sure. Because if they should arise in the resurrection of the wicked, they will once again look at the saints that they grew up with and served with. They'll be in the New Jerusalem, and Christ will be there, and the Father will be there, and they'll see it all. And do we not understand there will be a great panoramic review of this whole thing? There will be a rapid review of all 66 books, see? So we should be prepared for that. What if Ananias and Sapphira should look at all that and say, that's beautiful, that's beautiful? Any chance for us still? The Lord will say, nope, it's too late. Yeah, but we really want to. Nope, sorry, it's too late. That's arbitrary. If Ananias and Sapphira are confirmed, hard-hearted cheats, untouchable by the truth, they will arise in the resurrection when such people arise. And the whole revelation of the truth about God at the end will not touch them. And that will only confirm God's diagnosis that led him to resurrect them in the right resurrection, the resurrection of the unsavable. So I'd rather wait till that day because we might have some extraordinary surprises. If Manasseh, of course, he had a few years to make amends. But look at the thief on the cross. How long did he live? I mean, within a few moments of his death, he was reviling the Son of God to his face. You know, and then something happened. As he was dying, something happened. So I would rather leave it entirely with the Lord, or we might have to eat our words. You know, we'll have enough of that to eat in the hereafter anyway, so <laughs> why not leave, leave that open? But, yeah. Satan and all his hosts yes. knew exactly what had taken place in their minds and in their, in their yes. business. Yes. God and all the angels in heaven, all the they universe watching. was watching from all the other worlds. And what uh, was the position that God had to take at that particular time with respect to the advancing of his mm -hmm. infant church? Why does he do it all the time? Like right now, if just a lot of folk would die on the church floor, the work would pick up marvelously, wouldn't it? <laughs> Like in, in Sabbath school, some of you who teach uh, the little darlings, you know, who sometimes are not too attentive and too reverent. Don't you sometimes wish that two she-bears would peek in the back door of Sabbath school once in a while? You know, not tear anybody, but just inspire a little reverence and respect. Why doesn't the Lord use these methods? Well, that brings us to something else in, in the record. Why so many miracles those days? Why all the miracles, and don't we crave some miracles now? Well, since time is late, Ellen White comments, as you know, on this subject. The way in which Christ worked was to preach the word and to relieve suffering by miraculous works of healing. And you know, on Sunday, as you listen to TV all day, this is the in thing. The, the miracle of healing gives you authority. She wrote years ago, but I am instructed that we cannot now work in this way. For Satan will exercise his power by working miracles. 
God's servants today could not work by means of miracles because spurious works of healing claiming to be divine will be wrought. For this reason, the Lord has marked out a way in which his people are to carry forward a work of physical healing combined with the teaching of the word sanitariums, physicians, nurses. That's the way he chooses to work at the present time. In other words, God uses, as always, methods that are appropriate to the time. And right now, miracles are not the best method. They're the method that the adversary is using. Besides, a miracle has the least authority of all, doesn't it? because you have to interpret the miracle with great care. But now, let us look at some other things. Did you notice in 9-7, on the way to, to Damascus, 9-7, the men who were traveling with Paul stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. This event meant so much to Paul, he told it three times in Acts. Look at 22-9. 22.9 Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Now did they hear it or did they not? 9.7 says they did, and 22.9 says they didn't. Uh, that's a contradiction. If, if you're looking for contradictions to support your rejection of Scripture, there's one. And I only say that because I remember one time preaching in the church in Sacramento, and there was a lady becoming quite interested in the church. And on the way out, she shook my hand and said, if you can explain a contradiction in the Bible, I'd be willing to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so she stepped aside to tell me afterwards. She showed me Acts 9-7 and 22-9. Fortunately, it's one we used every year in teaching Greek up at PUC. It's a perfect example. Well, you see, in the Greek, when you use the verb to hear, which is akuo, from which we get acoustical tiling. Here's acoustical tiling here. When it is followed by its object in the accusative case, if you don't mind the technical terms, it means you hear the sound and you understand it. But if the object, say it's a voice, is in the genitive case, meaning the of case, then it means you may hear the sound, but you don't understand it, you see. That is, a kuo followed by, a voice is phoné, from which we get phonograph, phonetic, and so on. All right, if you have a kuo followed by phonane, the accusative case, that means you hear the sound and you understand it. If it's a kuo followed by not phonane, but phonase, the genitive case, it means you hear of it. You hear the sound, but you don't understand it. All right, in Acts 9, 7, it says they heard the voice. That's a kuo plus phonēs, that is, they heard the sound. Yes, they heard the sound. In Acts 22, 9, it says, they did not hear the phonēn, that is, they didn't understand it. So you put the two together, there's absolutely no contradiction whatsoever. They heard the sound of the voice, but they did not understand it. And you look in Acts of the Apostles, that's precisely what she says happened. Now, why the versions don't clear that up, I don't know, because it, it, it's in the Greek like that. Do you have a version that eliminates the contradiction? Anybody? Oh, how's yours? Read it. The uh, first time it says, uh, he heard the sound, but heard the sound. That's it. But did not see anyone. That's it. And then further over it says there that he, uh, they heard it, but could not understand the words. Heard the sound, but did not understand the words. Yeah, that's it. Does yours do it? Oh, no, that's good. That's a very literal translation. They did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking. Did not understand, you see. Oh, I'm pleased that they've done that. Does any other? Some just leave the contradiction in there. I didn't follow up on that lady. I don't know whether she did join. Usually when someone is bringing up such a minor matter, I think that person is grasping at straws. That's no reason to join or not to join, but she made it an important point that day. Now, what's much more significant is what happened on the Damascus Road. The story is also told in 26, isn't it? And this is the one that is at much greater length. Much greater length. Look at Acts 26, 12. Then I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, which was to imprison, persecute, and destroy early Christians. Now, when Paul went out to do this, um, was this a religious commission? This was a sacred assignment? Yes, this was to win souls. 
This is the same spirit as the spirit of the Inquisition. How do you win souls? Is it all right to use a little force? Well, he had a God who uh, demanded um, obedience under penalty of death. That's where he read the Old Testament. So what's wrong with using the same method in evangelism? When you have Saul's picture of God, which he thought he got right out of the 39 books and all the stories we've been reading, then you see nothing wrong with delivering as many souls bound hand and foot to the heavenly penitentiary as possible. At least get them there somehow. Well, had they not crucified Christ in God's name? They saw nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with the use of force. And Jesus came and was so gentle, they were frustrated by his gentleness. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And their hopes sank. If that's the way he is, we're never going to beat the Romans. You mean God is as soft as you are? And they denied it. They said, our God is the God of Sinai. And Saul went out as an evangelist to defend his God, carrying the 39 books of the Old Testament and all the key texts therein. And he went out to use force. Obey God and live. Disobey God and he will destroy you. Do I make myself clear? And he went out to stamp out heresy. So nothing wrong with it. And how did God win him? Well, I like the thought that Stephen started it. I think that was a very good point to make. I think his conscience had smitten him. And Ellen White comments to that effect. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining round me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, this is Sinai over again, isn't it? Terrified. When I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language. God always speaks our language. If he had been Chinese, it would have been in Chinese, you know. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It hurts you to kick against the goads, or what do you have there? Of his conscience, meaning that Saul was having trouble with his conscience. And look at the Lord's appeal. Well, Saul, I don't have to say anything more to you. You're having trouble already with the truth. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have, appointed, I have appeared to you for this purpose. This is why I've come. To appoint you to serve and bear witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. Would you have appointed someone under those circumstances? Could you imagine the conference committee appointing somebody as their evangelist under these circumstances? The Lord was very far-sighted here. And I will deliver you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith and trust in me. Think of giving Saul, who is on his way to persecute and destroy Christians, on his way to do it, he gives him a commission like this to enlighten everybody. It's incredible. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And I went and delivered it. Now we need to add 9, 7, and 22, 9 to get the detail that he was told to go to Ananias for information. Now, would you have sought to win Saul like this? Now, here's God in action now. That's the marvelous thing. The first problem is, how do you get the attention of a man bent on the destruction of the saints? Well, you speak a language he can understand, which is not only Hebrew, but a little show of force. And he floored Saul on the road to Damascus. And maybe for the first time in a long time, Saul was quiet. And he listened. And the Lord said, you're having trouble with your conscience, aren't you? And Saul, indeed I am. Ever since I saw Stephen do what you did and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I, I loved that, and yet he was a heretic. How could a heretic behave like that? That has troubled me because I really honor that kind of thing. I'm confused. I read in Leviticus about love, and you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart. I love the things that Moses said, and Amos said, and Hosea said, and Micah said. But then I remember Sinai, and I remember Korodath and Abiram, and Nadab and Abihu, and Lot's wife, and the flood, and all the rest, and I can't put this all together. And Jesus expressed confidence in him and said, well, retreat for a little while. It may take you a little time. He put 14 years into this thing before we hear much more about him. He did pay a visit to headquarters to check in with the brethren. Though we have to read Galatians, that was a very interesting experience that he had when, when he went down to headquarters. 
He said, I still didn't get any gospel from them. I got mine directly from the Lord and from the Old Testament. And he never was fully in harmony in all details with headquarters, which cost him his life in the end. But he must have been basically an honest student of the Old Testament. He just didn't have it worked out right. And the Lord appealed to his honesty and his humility and his integrity and his sensitivity to truth. And Saul was won by this. And he knew all about Sinai getting people's attention. But he also knew about Elijah at the mouth of the cave that the Lord much prefers to talk softly. And what I like is Paul was prepared to accomplish what some of us take a lifetime to do. He graduated from Sinai to the mouth of the cave in about 30 seconds flat. And I don't think this needs to take that long, see? You'd say, well, it's going to take the church 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to move to the mouth of the cave. If we've been honest in following God so far, we may still be pitched at Sinai. But there's a, there's a, there's a quick elevator up to the mouth of the cave if we've been preparing as Saul did. Because he was touched by the still small voice who reasoned with his conscience, that all. And then the Lord said, unless I overwhelm you, Saul, which does happen to be your method, I'm not going to tell you anything more to do. I want you to go to Ananias, a fellow human being, and talk it over with him. Now, what do you think of the method used? And I think that's why when Paul dealt with the problems in Corinth, he was so convinced he never should force anybody anymore that maybe he overdid it a wee bit. And it didn't work in Corinth, and he had to write that letter. You know, he remembered then the Damascus Road, and he remembered Sinai, and he remembered Mount Carmel and those other occasions, and he wrote them some letter, and he got their attention. But then he wrote a fourth one, and it's all very loving and gracious. It seems to me that on the Damascus Road, we have a marvelous example of how God meets a person where he is. And if it takes a little show of force to get attention and reverence and respect and a willingness to listen, he will do whatever needs to be done. But then if we're ready, he quickly moves to reason with us with a still small voice. And Saul got the message. From then on, when he met people who disagreed over the Sabbath, did he imprison them? Romans 14? No, he said, one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems all days alike. And there was a day I would have imprisoned you for that and voted that you be killed. But now I say, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. As he was persuaded on the Damascus Road. And it's absolutely marvelous how quickly he put it together. Although he did have to think it over for a while, as you know in the record. I think we see the results of the Damascus Road experience all through the rest of his letters. He now knew the truth about God. Did he change God's name? Did he change his Bible? Did he change his Sabbath? Did he change his diet? Did he change anything? All he changed was his picture of God. That's the only thing he changed. And that's what led him to treat people in a different way. Because I believe the way we worship and the way we treat people and most of all the way we persuade people of the truth is determined by the kind of person we believe God to be. So he was changed in his behavior. And then he changed his name to a name that means small. Interestingly enough, he felt that way. A greater dramatic move to save a man than is... Necessary. Yes. At least he does. Like uh, I like that. Raymond Holmes, the Lutheran minister. Read the uh, Stranger in My Home. Read that book too, and you get the same picture. Yes. No, I believe God stoops to meet us where we are, but He doesn't stoop to a level uh, lower than the highest we can reach. He He met Saul on a high level. It did take a little that two by four to get his attention. It's true, as the man with the mule. But once he'd got it, then he knew Saul's background, and Saul was really ready to go from then on. Two other little things as we go on. What did you think of the organization of the church since we're reorganizing the Adventist church these days? One of Elder Wilson's goals is to streamline the Adventist church, as you know, and to economize. Did you notice in 6.1, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, 6.1, and they had a plan to win a million souls in a thousand days, the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the body of the disciples and said, I thought the twelve were the disciples. No, there were lots of disciples. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, sometimes we think of to serve tables as a demeaning task. Then remember Stephen's speech, see, 
He was a table server, but he could also preach. Therefore, brethren, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, there it is again, and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we leaders now, we leaders, will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and the others that are named. Verse 6, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands upon them. And as a result, because the leaders now were not in charge, things began to fall apart. No, the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith, which is something to think about in terms of church organization, isn't it? It, it is interesting, when our church meets in gatherings large and small, the ones who most frequently are given the privilege of focusing the attention of the disciples on the essence of the message are men who speak ex officio because of their position as leaders. Now, we do that, don't we? Well, if we went to general conference and the general conference president didn't speak, something would be wrong. At conference president, uh, 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 camp meetings, at union meetings, men who are appointed to positions of leadership are also looked to as the ones best able to present the truth. But many of them have an enormous task serving tables. It's a much bigger task now. You think of the work it is to lubricate the complicated machinery of the Adventist church worldwide these days. I don't know how our general leaders survive physically, traveling through all these time zones and all the things they have to eat to be hospitable in all the lands of earth. They have a very special digestive system, let alone everything else to survive. And we expect this of them. And when an emergency arises in our area, we expect our leaders to be here and help us. I think it's a tremendous task we assign. We also expect them to have devoted so much time to Bible study and prayer that they could do the best job that anybody could at presenting the word to us and focusing our attention on it. Well, the apostles said we can do it. Choose others who are specially gifted along these lines to handle some of these matters and we will concentrate on the most important thing that's been assigned to us. It's quite a lesson to contemplate. How to do it in our huge church, I don't know. But you notice the results? Yes. The Holy Spirit a little bit, how Jesus sent the Holy Spirit or the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to work so he could go back so everybody wouldn't be bombarding him. You know, because everybody would have came from all over the coast, over the world, just yes. to sit at Jesus' feet. And he wouldn't have been able to get to each other personally yes. in his lifetime. Well, I wonder if sometimes we are unreasonable in what we expect of our leaders, too. Because we, we, we demand it of them as well. Well, what do you think of Paul now, who did devote himself not to administration, did he, at all? He devoted himself to evangelism, and he arrives in Athens, and he appears on Mars Hill and delivers a very erudite presentation. And he shows that he really knows his Greek. And you'd have to do that in Athens, wouldn't you? So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive, now which version shall we use? That in all things you are most superstitious. One of the fundamental principles one learns in public speaking is that you do not antagonize your audience in the first sentence if you hope to persuade them later on. And to say they were very superstitious in the modern idiom would not be polite. Well, he didn't. What he said in Greek was, O men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are the longest word in the Greek New Testament. Daisy Daimonus Terus. That's all one word. And it means very religious. Very religious. Do any version have that? Yeah, yeah very religious? That's it. That's uh, 1722. Is yours complimentary? It's a compliment. He didn't insult his audience. He was very winsome. I mean, this is after Damascus Road, remember. Oh, Athenians, he said, I see that you are very religious. And then he goes on to explain how very religious they were. He said, why as I passed through your city, I found, I found representations of all the gods I've ever heard of. That's how religious you are. I even found an altar to the unknown God. Now that's being very, very religious. Now it so happens I know this unknown God. 
and I come to tell you about him. Now, there's one skillful introduction to a public presentation. He complimented them. He turned their idolatry into a compliment. Isn't that the only way to go? And then he gave this speech and he quoted the right authors, the philosophers and the poets. And he won a few at the end, didn't he? But some of them said, well, that's very interesting. We'll give that study and see you here another day, which is what often happens after deeply philosophical and theological presentations. And Paul said, I did win a few, but I don't think that's the best way. Though Ellen White says, look at him meet philosophy with philosophy and logic with logic, she expresses admiration for Paul in this Mars Hill presentation. But good as it was, Paul says, I, I'm not going to do it that way again. From now on, I will preach nothing but Christ and him crucified. And the, one of the first examples of that will be Romans next time. What does he mean when he says, I'll preach Christ and him crucified? A narrower message or a more focused message? We're using different methods. He doesn't quote poets and philosophers much anymore. And I just wonder what this says about our public presentations at the present time. But now, while we're in 17, as a last thing, you remember he spent part of his time in prison. Do I have the right place? No, I don't. Um, where, I want Paul in Philippi. 16. 16. There we are, 16. I have the right verses in the wrong chapter. Look at this, and let's end with this, because it really fits in with everything that's past and everything that's coming, especially Romans. You remember that Paul is in prison, and the earthquake comes. And in the midst of the earthquake, with the doors of the prison bursting open, the jailer is smitten with terror because he is held personally responsible for the prisoners, and should one escape, he would be put to death. So in terror, he comes to the door, sees that they're open, assumes the prisoners have run, and is about to kill himself. It's nice of them being killed by somebody else. And Paul cried out with a loud voice, 1628, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. What a relief to him. And he called for lights, and he rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, if you have the time, we have 20 lessons here in our briefcase. And if you'll be willing to go through after the 20th, we'll talk about baptism, and then you can be saved. And Paul, in an earthquake, had only a few moments. And so he had to distill the whole thing into one sentence. And he said, place your faith in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now, in the um, King James, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, don't underestimate that. In the Greek, there's only one word for belief or faith or trust or confidence. It's always the same. And so to go to all the effort we sometimes do to show the difference between belief and faith is interesting in English, but it doesn't work in the Greek. There is only one word. So what Paul said was trust in the Lord. Have confidence in the Lord. Place your faith in the Lord. Or believe. They're all exactly the same. And you will be saved, you and your household. Is that enough? If you only have a minute, is that enough? Of course, it depends what we take faith to mean. This is no idle opinion. Faith means a whole attitude toward the one in whom you place your trust, implying a willingness to listen, love and admiration and so on. Yes? How does verse 32, which comes right after, how does that fit into this? Well, and they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house later on, you see. And that's what, that's what followed, to be sure. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once with all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced with all his household that he had believed in God. So when there was a little more time, they did engage in Bible study. You see, they did, to follow. But when you've only got a minute to summarize the essence of the whole thing, is it right to say all God asks of us is trust? Because if we trust God, he's well able to save and heal. Anybody who trusts him, that's it. And I may not know all the rest of theology. Like the thief on the cross, what did he know? And I may not even know what God does to me. And I may not know any Latin words like justification and sanctification and propitiation and expiation and all the rest of it. But if I trust him, I'll be willing to let him do to me what needs to be done. 
There is no substitute for trust. That's the essence of it all. Of course, God does not ask us to trust him as a stranger. And we'd be fools to trust someone who is not worthy of our trust. So God at infinite length has revealed that he is trustworthy. He hasn't just claimed to be trustworthy. He's shown that he can be trusted in all these records. And then we go out and present the picture of God and say, do you like what you hear? What do you think of all the evidence in support of this? Do you like him enough to trust him? That's all God asks of you. He is our creator, and he knows how we've been hurt and damaged, but he is readily able to heal all who trust him. But as a physician, can you heal a patient who doesn't trust you? Thinks you're a quack, is afraid, won't come to the office because he's afraid you're going to hurt him. He's going to hurt you, rather. Would you go to a doctor who says, if you don't come next week, I'll find you in your home and I'll kill you. Now you get to my office, right? Wouldn't you move to another city, to another town? You know, you'd go. The, the false picture of God is what has destroyed trust. That's one of the things that's destroyed trust. There is another thing that's destroyed trust. That's the incredible ability to see the truth clearly and still turn against God. That's perversity. And the devil knew God well and turned against him. The Jews, Caiaphas, had a moment of conviction. Do you remember? He said, this, this, this is the one, but then he tore his robes and tried to quench it. That's the worst kind of thing. But it always goes back to the same thing. Do we find God worthy of our trust? Not because of claims, but because of evidence. Then how do we win people? But by talking about God to them. But don't just make claims, say, here's the evidence. Look at the way he treats sinners, Simon and Judas and all the rest. That's the kind of God he is. He's not only powerful, but he can be trusted to use his power in such a way. And some of us are one to trust. And God says, that's good. Now, see, that's Abraham. Abraham trusted God, and God said, that's good. Or Abraham trusted God, and cash registers rang, and there was imputing of things. Well, the language is in there. How are we to understand it? Romans is the best place to discuss it. But the best way to understand Romans is to read the rest of Paul's epistles, which we will do one after the other. And I think we have an almost unbroken sequence here, and I, I hope it will prove to be very profitable for us. Nice thing that goes along with that is, you know, the word disciple means uh, a learner. Um, make pupils, which implies an attitude, a learning attitude. And a Laodicean says, I'm rich and increased with goods and don't need to know anything. So he is not a disciple. There are no Laodicean disciples. They're not, well, they're bad disciples. But the very word itself implies a willingness to listen and to learn and to accept correction. So he says, go out to the world and see if you can persuade people to be willing to listen. And what is it that moves people but to picture what God is like? And maybe the kindness of God will lead some to repentance. Oh, that's Romans 2, 4. And to faith. Oh, that's Romans 10, 17. We need Romans next, and that's the one for next week. Should we pray before we go? Our loving Father in heaven, history seems to repeat itself century by century. And when we read about the early Christians going out with the good news, they were willing to risk their lives to present it. They ran into incredible opposition, mostly from religious people, mostly from their own people who were unwilling to accept correction. And yet the correction was so desirable how utterly perverse it was. The same thing seems to be happening now and has through the years and did in Old Testament times. Surely we see the hand of the enemy in all of this, seeking to confuse people, confirming them in their stubborn unwillingness to listen. But may we do as Paul did and not pass judgment on others, but look to ourselves. How willing are we to listen and to accept correction of even our most cherished views as need may be? Surely our only safety, even though we may feel strongly convinced tonight that we have the truth, is to continually submit our convictions to the correction of the scriptures. We understand this is the way the Spirit who brings conviction and correction does his work. And so we go through book by book because we are willing to listen. And as we come to Romans now, where well, Saul, who was so marvelously changed when he got the picture of thee, now looks back over the whole history of the plan of salvation and explains it as perhaps no one else has. 
May we miss nothing that is intended there for our enlightenment and our understanding and our correction. One thing does seem clear wherever we look into the Bible. All thou hast ever asked of thy children, in heaven or on earth, is trust and mutual trustworthiness. That does not seem to have changed at all. It's just that now we've seen even greater evidence that thou art infinitely worthy of our trust. We marvel that though thou art infinite in power and canst run this universe any way thou dost choose, we marvel at the way thou hast chosen to run it. That for it to remain free, there must be mutual trust and trustworthiness, mutual love and respect. And yet thou dost not ask us to trust even thee without evidence upon which to base that faith. How readily thou couldst have stood on high and thundered to thy children. I demand that I be trusted and obeyed, and yet there would have been something hollow in there. For why should we without evidence? And this indeed thou hast supplied to us, far more than we surely should need. May we share with the angels on Resurrection Sunday in telling thee that it is more than enough. And then may we, like Paul, be so convinced that we could say if anyone comes with a different picture of our God, he is wrong and we will not believe it. And then that would give us the courage to go out and even at risk of life present the truth as we know it to be. But if we do present it as it really is, it will be in love and respect and patience and politeness. There will be no arrogance, no rudeness, no insisting even on having our own way. And therein we understand lies the power of the good news. And yet it is not powerful to those who are hard of heart, but those who are tender of heart and are waiting to be moved by this approach. How many people do not know thee to be this kind of a God? What a pleasure to go and tell them that it is so. May we do it well, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.